Retina Rounds, episode number 136. Failed scleral buckle. Scleral buckling is an important surgical skill that every vitro-retinal surgeon should be comfortable performing, particularly in young phacic patients without a PVD. The patient in today's case presented by guest surgeon of the week, Dr. Michael Klufus, is the ideal candidate for a buckle, a young healthy patient with a clear natural lens and no PVD. However, despite a well-placed scleral buckle, the procedure failed. Let's see how Dr. Klufus treated this patient, and at the end we'll discuss why buckles fail and strategies for management. Thank you, Dr. Klufus, for sharing this case. Okay, you can see here that Dr. Klufus has opted to perform a vitrectomy for this patient who has a failed scleral buckle. Initially, you can see that there is some vitreous haze, although not really any vitreous clumps or any other signs of PVR. Now, the core vitrectomy is performed and some trimcinolone is placed uh, to identify the posterior hyaloid, and you can see here Dr. Klufus is inducing the PVD. Now, in patients with a failed scleral buckle, sometimes there can be significant residual vitreous traction, and in these eyes, elevating the PVD can be particularly challenging. So you can see here Dr. Klufus is, uh, in, is, has stained and is now engaging uh, the, the hyaloid face. You can see that the PVD has been uh, elevated at least over the posterior pole, over the macula. And now Dr. Klufus is going to put some perfluorocarbon liquid down to provide a little bit of counter traction. And this, in this retina that's completely detached, uh, pulling up on the hyaloid can be particularly challenging since there is uh, no counter traction. Uh, and so using a perfluorocarbon liquid can serve as almost like a third hand to hold the retina down while he's elevating up the PVD. And you can see here he's using uh, some additional triamcinolone just to better, better visualize the vitreous. And he's using the shave mode. Uh, this is uh, surgery that's being performed on the ev uh, with the Eva Nexus. Uh, and you can see here that um, he's uh, doing a combination of elevating uh, with the uh, vitreous cutter and shaving uh, the, uh, the vitreous with the, uh, with the cutter, uh, taking care to use this shave mode to efficiently remove the vitreous, but also not to uh, create too much turbulence and potentially create an iatrogenic retinal break. So you can see that this, uh, the, the, the vitreous base appears to be a bit more posterior uh, in this patient. Uh, the vitreous is uh, clearly very adherent to the retina. And again, Dr. Klufus is using the shave mode on the even nexus to trim back the vitreous, try to relieve as much traction uh, as possible. So it's this very uh, careful combination of shaving, elevating, and then uh, further elevating up the uh, perfluorocarbon liquid uh, to stabilize the retina. So now you can see some additional uh, vitreous shaving that's being performed 360 degrees. You can see the buckle, uh, the buckle contour here, which looks to be well positioned. It looks like it's, um, it's uh, circumferentially supporting uh, this posterior extent of the vitreous base. You can see here some, uh, some hemorrhage is present, proximal to uh, some areas of lattice degeneration, as well as uh, more anteriorly located uh, retinal break. And uh, in this phacic eye, you can see he's switching between two hands to thoroughly trim back uh, the vitreous right at the posterior margin of the vitreous base. In this part here, you can see that uh, he's uh, lifted up the hyaloid, which is trapped under this uh, perfluorocarbon liquid bubble, uh, and now he's able to uh, more thoroughly trim back the vitreous uh, in the nasal quadrant. Now he's using some diathermy to uh, mark the retinal break, uh, to mark uh, uh, some areas of lattice degeneration as well, uh, and, um, and a couple of other small atrophic holes that are here, and uh, continuing to shave uh, very meticulously uh, trimming back the vitreous just to re relieve as much uh, vitro-retinal traction as possible. Now an air fluid exchange is being performed uh, and this is going to allow uh, the uh, retina to flatten, uh, sandwiching uh, the retina between the air that's going to be uh, more anteriorly located and the perfluorocarbon liquid that's more posteriorly located. You can see here that he's, um, he's elevating up the level of the PFL uh, and now performing some uh, endolaser around this retinal break, uh, as well as some adjacent areas of lattice degeneration. Now that the retinal breaks have been treated, uh, he's going to go ahead and take down the perfluorocarbon liquid, uh, exchanging for air. And now uh, Dr. Klufus has opted to in implant silicone oil, and the reason for this is this patient is, uh, does not live uh, in his area, is going to need to travel back home, and due to altitude restrictions, he's chosen to use silicone oil. Uh, this, uh, the sclerotomies are being sewn shut uh, using vicral suture, and that uh, concludes the case. 
So here's some discussion points. Now, generally, good candidates for primary scleral buckle uh, include patients without a PVD, young patients, phacic patients without a significant cataract, uh, retinal dialyses, which have a very high success rate with scleral buckling, uh, patients for whom gas tamponade is contraindicated due to travel or altitude limitations, and that was the case uh, for uh, Dr. Klufus' patient, and extensive lattice degeneration. On the other hand, poor candidates for primary scleral buckle are patients with a significant media opacity that precludes good visualization of the retinal breaks, very posterior breaks that are difficult to support with a scleral buckle, uh, or macular hole-associated retinal detachments, uh, patients with extensive PVR, typically grade C and above, and those with giant retinal tears, especially those uh, in which the retina is folded on itself. So why do buckles fail? Well, just as with any treatment for regbitogenous retinal detachments, failure is often due to proliferative vitreoretinopathy. In this study by Samir Patel and co-authors published in Retina in 2021, buckles failed in about 13% of cases. And PVR-associated failed scleral buckles were more likely in patients with the vitreous hemorrhage, preoperative PVR, and in smokers. Now, other reasons for failed scleral buckles include missed retinal breaks, uh, a poorly positioned buckle uh, that does not adequately support the retinal break, insufficient buckle height, uh, which is insufficient to counteract the effect of vitreoretinal traction, and significant residual vitreous traction. And this, is, this last factor is most likely the cause in Dr. Klufus's case, and we can appreciate the degree to which the vitreous was tightly adherent to the retina. So what can you do when buckles fail? Well, first you have to ask yourself whether or not it's truly a buckle failure. Now sometimes residual subretinal fluid can be slow to resorb, and residual subretinal fluid can shift, making it appear that the retinal detachment is worsening. Close observation with serial fundus photography and OCTs can help you to track the subretinal fluid and determine whether it is actually worsening. Now, if the buckle has in fact failed, you have some options. One would be to revise the buckle either by repositioning it, uh, tightening it to achieve a greater buckle height, or adding an additional element like a radial sponge, which can work to support more posteriorly located retinal breaks. Although not my preferred practice, especially in retinal detachments with inferior breaks, the injection of an expansile gas bubble can sometimes help to reattach the retina. And last, of course, pars plane of vitrectomy can be performed to relieve vitreoretinal traction. But as shown in Dr. Klufus's case, if significant residual vitreous traction is the cause of a failed buckle, elevation of the hyaloid with vitrectomy can be particularly challenging. Now, fortunately, this patient did well uh, achieving uh, retinal reattachment and improved uh, postoperative visual acuity despite the challenging vitrectomy. Again, we want to thank Dr. Klufus for sharing this case and for giving us an opportunity to learn more about the management of failed scleral buckles. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, Please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.